My name is Stan Noop. I was born at the Bomb Mine at Dakota, Colorado on the 10th of June of 1923. Okay, did you grow up uh, around Dakota? I grew up, I would after I was born, uh, my folks lived in Longmans at the time, and then we moved to Brighton. And we moved to Frederick in 1932. I attended school there and graduated in May of 1941. And after I graduated, I joined the Navy, went to boot camp in San Diego, California and went to San Pedro, and that's where I went aboard the USS Vessel in October of 1941. How did you happen to join the Navy right out of high school? Well, I corresponded with several of my friends in Frederick that were in the Navy, and we corresponded back and forth for several years, and I decided I want to be a career man in the Navy. <clears throat> and that's why I joined. So you were, you jumped in before you thought about war or anything else, you just thought the Navy was a good career? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So when you uh, <coughs> left San Pedro, where did you go then on the Vestal? We went to, right directly to Pearl Harbor. When did you arrive there? What's, remember the, the month? Or? We arrived, uh, about the 11th of October, 1941. What kind of a ship was the Vestal? It was a repair ship. We repaired uh, cruisers, uh, different kinds of small craft, <clears throat> but more, mostly combat ships. And Pearl Harbor was at the center of activity then for you? That's correct. So how many ships were at Pearl Harbor, do you remember, approximately? Oh boy, there was a bunch of, well, there was about seven battleships, all sorts of cruisers, destroyers. There was uh, other repair ships there. There was destroyer uh, tenders, Dixie, all sorts of, all sorts of different ships. Pearl Harbor really was a place for you to go to work and uh, That's right. have everything right at your fingertips. Right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, December 7th on 1941. What do you remember about all that? Well, uh, at that time I was a mess cook. My duties was to work in the scullery. That's where we washed all the uh, silverware, the cups, the bowls the trades, and that's what we were doing when the uh, alarms went off. There was all sorts of alarms that went off when the attack started. We had the fire alarms, general quarters, everything went off all at one time, and it was a mess. What was the feeling when all of that started? Because you hadn't thought anything was going to happen. No, we had no idea what was going on. It was mass confusion, really. When General Quarters was called, where did you go? Well, I, I of course, working in the scullery, we were wearing swimming trunks because it was so wet and steamy. So everything stopped all at once, and we put on our T-shirts, and we wore tennis shoes, and we put on our t-shirts and our long white pants and went to our battle stations. My battle station was up forward to where they brought the ammunition up from the magazines and we carried ammunition up to the bathtub on the forecastle where we had a 50 caliber machine guns. Then when we took the bomb hit from the forecastle, why that stopped the uh, ammunition going up to the forecastle. What were your feelings when you went to your station that morning? That, uh, did you have any idea what was happening? 
Well, we knew something was going on because uh, there was so much confusion. And after the bomb came through the forecastle, and it went through the mess deck, and it continued down to our lower GSK storeroom. And then we went out to the well deck, and we could look over at the Arizona. And we could see sailors from the Arizona coming out of their compartments. And they would go right back into their compartments, and then they, they never came out again. And then pretty soon, we heard the orders to abandon ship. And of course, we went out from our mess deck out to the well deck. And that's when we abandoned ship. And we climbed out our boat booms where a motor launch is tied up. And we took the Jacob slider down to our boats that had come alongside our ship. And we got into our motor launches and then went from our ship over to the fleet landing at Pearl Harbor and went ashore there. Okay, were you under any machine gun fire or things of that sort from the Japanese planes? Well, they had been strafing our ship and that's where we lost some of our men up in the bathtub. I lost a real good friend up in the on a 50 caliber machine gun up on a forecastle. And we lost seven men that day from our ship. Were they able to fire back at first? And yeah, they were firing at the Japanese planes that were launching torpedoes into the Arizona. Now explain where the Vestal was in comparison to the Arizona. We were right along the Arizona. We'd gone up alongside the Arizona, I think about on the 6th or the 4th of December, I'm not sure what day, but we had gone alongside her to do repair work to her. We went along her port side to do repair work on her. What about torpedoes? They were coming in. How did they go under the Vestal? Or what That's what my understanding was. They was going underneath us into the Arizona. Now you were talking about the, the guys on the Arizona. They'd come out of their, their compartments. Or were they just coming out to, to see what was happening then, going back for yeah. cover? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, could you kind of explain that to me? Because I asked the question wrong there. But tell what they were doing when they came out of those. Uh, they would come out of their compartments on their main deck, and we could look down at them. On and see what they were doing, and they would go right back into their compartments. My gosh. Well, what happened then when you finally got got yourself off the ship and uh, over to the, the? When we got off the boats at Fleet Landing, we went right up to the receiving station and checked in, and then they. A lot of the people from the receiving stations, and they took a bunch of us and put us on the Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania was in dry dock, and they were flooding that dry dock to get the Pennsylvania out. Well, the Pennsylvania took a bomb hit, and then we abandoned the Pennsylvania. How many hours after the initial attack was that? It wasn't long after the attack started that uh, they took us over to the Pennsylvania. And then we abandoned the Pennsylvania. And then they put us on different details there in the Navy Yard. We helped with the wounded and, and so forth. And they had us on all sorts of different details all day long there in the Navy Yard. Yeah. Put out a commission and had to abandon Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh. What do you remember when you got into the ships, were there a lot of people in the water, a lot of men in the water, when you came off the Vestal? Well, not really, because it didn't take us long to get from our ship over to the, over to the fleet landing. Goodness. Question about uh, the 
Vestal, uh, it wasn't sunk. What happened to the Vestal? Well, see, we took the bomb hip forward, and it stopped in our lower GSA storeroom. And the bomb that went back aft, it went clear through the ship. And Captain Young got blown off, and he swam back to the quarterdeck. He came back aboard ship and countermanded the order to abandon ship. They cut the lines between us and the Arizona and got steam up and got underway and took the ship over and beached it over by IEM. So that saved the ship? That saved the ship, yes. Now, you were given uh, orders to abandon ship, so you yes. were off. Did yeah. you see then? Could you look back and see the vessel start to no. go where you were totally away from it? Then? Yeah. It didn't, didn't take long to go from the ship over to Fleet Landing. And of course, we lost track of the ship. Were you uh, under fire over at Fleet Landing or were they concentrating on their ships? They were concentrating on Battleship Row in Hickam Field, or uh, Fort Island, the Naval Air Station at Fort Island. That's where they were. The concentration was. It must have been just total chaos. It was. To watch it. Nothing but chaos. This is a strange question, but have you seen the movie Pearl Harbor? No. I was curious about that because uh, Hollywood does that strange thing. Yeah. To, uh, to try and recreate something in their their own image. <laughs> I figure I'll see it someday, but right, right now I have. I have no desire to see it. I figure I was there, and I'll see it someday. You have enough memories that you yes. don't need any more. Mm -hmm. But just, you have been back to the Arizona yes. Memorial. What kind of a feeling was that? Well, we went there in 1975, and it brought back a lot of It brought back a lot of sad feeling. It has to be tough, but are you happy that they have created that memorial? Yes, people can sure has. It? Yeah. What kind of people were there when you when you went to the the memorial? Was it just a cross section of people? Yeah, it. I noticed. There was a lot of Japanese people there, and it was very impressive. I've never been on a place where it was so quiet, utterly, utterly quiet. There was no laughing, there was no loud talking. Very, very impressive. I urge that anybody that ever goes to Oahu to go to the Arizona Memorial. That memorial seems to affect everyone that goes there, doesn't it? it I think so. It was very, very impressive. I hope I have another chance sometime, and now I'd like, I understand they have a nice museum, and I hope someday that I have a chance to, I would like to go back, I really would. Have you talked to other Pearl Harbor survivors and uh, compared notes with them, or has it been something you just don't talk about that much? Well, I've talked to other people who've been there. I've gone to several ships reunion and talked with a lot of my old friends and you know, I want to go back. I really do. Have you kept in close contact with some of the old old friends from the ship, personally besides the reunions? No, no. We all kind of get scattered, don't we? Yes, we do. We sure do. I want to go back to something here too. I'm going to get back into uh, the war on war in Pearl Harbor, but uh, getting back to when you entered the Navy. Were you aware at that time that there was any threat from the Japanese or the Germans of thinking that you would end up in a war when you enlisted? 
I wasn't aware of the we of the Japanese problem. I knew there was a problem with the Germans, but I had no idea that we had a problem with the Japanese. And even after you got to Pearl Harbor, you had, just didn't have any uh, inkling whatsoever that uh, the Japanese could possibly attack? None at all. None at all. So that when it actually happened, it was just such a total shock to you and the rest of your men, did they pretty much feel the same way? I think so. But you know, I, a lot of us, I know, I wasn't scared. And I don't think a lot of the guys I was with aboard ship were scared. I think uh, we were more scared after it happened as to, we weren't really scared at the time. I know I wasn't afraid. It was after it happened, we were afraid what's going to happen next. We were afraid that there was going to be an invasion afterwards. When something like that starts and you're in the middle of it, do you just kind of go kind of on autopilot? I think so. I, I really am truthful that I, I wasn't scared at the time it happened. I was more afraid afterwards as to what could have happened at the time. You had time to think then about yeah. all of it. Were there any answers for you at all there from uh, officers or from, from the Navy? Mm -mm. I think people were m mad. Once we saw these Japanese planes, they were coming in so low. When we were out on deck and you could see these planes coming in, well, hell, you could look up and you, you could see the pilots. When you were, when the attack started, you mentioned you were down below on the mess deck. About how long did it take you to realize what was really going on? Well, it, it it really didn't take you too long because we could go out and see our, our mess deck went right out onto the well deck and you could look outside and you could see these planes coming in on the, on the starboard side of our ship. You could look out towards fleet landing and you could see these planes coming in on the starboard side of the ship. We were, you know, they were that damn low. Could you see torpedoes being dropped? No, I couldn't. But you just knew that they were attacking on every plane. Yeah. Were there a lot of planes you could see? I couldn't see that many planes. What was the noise like when all this was going on? Did you hear, or were you just kind of... Uh, it was sort of numbing, really. So your mind just kind of tells you to do what you have to do. Yeah. After the final attack had happened, um, were you just uh, fearful that there was going to, going to be another one, or that you were, they were going to be coming back a yeah. year later or whenever? You see, when we abandoned ship, that's when you could really see stuff because we were on the starboard side of the ship getting in, climbing down these Jacob's Ladder from our boat boom into our launches from boats from our ship, and that's where you could see everything coming from fleet landing. That's where we were going to, and that's where you could see everything. We had a clear view of all these planes coming in, torpedo planes coming in. Oh, yeah, it was. When uh, you mentioned that uh, after the attack, everybody was afraid of an invasion, what kind of uh, things were going on at that point? Uh, what kind of preparations were being made as 
uh, with people thinking that the Japanese were going to come back or were going to try to invade the Hawaiian Islands. I don't know what the thinking was because, see, after this first attack, we were then on over fleet landing. That's before the second attack came. Because we were already over fleet landing before the second attack ever came. How long was it in between the, the waves? Well, I think the first attack was what, at 7.55. And I can't remember what, the, what time the second attack was because we were already over on the beach at that time. Did you feel that uh, maybe you were a little safer over there than being on, on ship? Did you just figure they were? And I figured we were. I felt safer. The I felt safer on the beach. But you didn't feel totally safe. Cause it no, because you could look up and you could see these bombs coming down on the second attack. Just one more question. I'll sure. Put you on the spot a little bit here. This is off of Pearl Harbor, but do you remember any uh, just anecdotes, uh, interesting stories, uh, funny stories, whatever? Just something happened to you when you were in the Navy uh, with your buddies, anything like that? Just something that uh, has stuck out throughout all the years with you? I know we're asking you to think of something right offhand, but uh, I just—it doesn't have to be related to the war. It doesn't have to be related to anything. Just. Uh, Oh, there were a lot of there were a lot of funny things that happened that I really don't stick out in my mind as right now. I really don't. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm gonna have one more question here. But I know one thing that was sort of funny. We had a, a boatswain mate that was on a fantail. It was real heavy. And he jumped off the fantail during the attack. And they say when he came back up that he had mud on his feet. When he came back up and they claimed he hit bottom during the attack. Now whether that happened or not, I don't know. But that was one of the funny things that they claimed he went down so deep that he got mud on his feet. And I, I don't know that that happened, but. And then they had another kid that uh, they claim he couldn't swim, and he swam all the way from the ship to the beach during the attack. Now, whether or not that happened, I don't know. But there were a lot of funny things that came up after the attack. You know, whether or not they happened, I don't know. But there were a lot of funny things that, you know, that came up after the attack that you laugh about. They weren't funny at the time, but, you know, the guys brought up. You could look back now. Yeah. Just a quick question about uh, the captain of the Vestal. He saved it and, and beached it. How long did he stay aboard the Vestal? Well, see, he stayed aboard. See, Captain Young, Commander Young, he was a naval commander. He was an old sub -sailor. So he stayed aboard the ship, and when we went down to the South Pacific, we went to New Caledonia. And see, the skipper was on the San Francisco. Something happened to him, so they flew Captain Young, Commander Young, from our ship up, and he took command of the San Francisco, a heavy cruiser. And they went into combat up in the Solomon Islands and they went into a place and there was only one way in and there was one way out. Well, the San Francisco, they knocked the hell out of her. And Cap Command, he made full captain after the attack on Pearl Harbor. He made his fourth stripe. And he was killed, and there was an admiral aboard this San Francisco, and they were both killed. They went in, they had to turn around, and it's a either going in or coming out. I don't know what. 
they were both killed. And we did not know until we got to wherever it was that Captain Young had been killed because we still had all his gear aboard our ship. So he couldn't have been aboard too long then. Mm -mm, he was only on to San Francisco. I don't know how long he was aboard when he was killed. And our crew really thought a lot of Captain Young. We dearly loved him. He used to come down from his quarters and he'd go through our chow line and eat with the crew. And we really loved that man. Was that unusual that a captain was that close to his men? Oh, I don't know if it's unusual, but you know, a lot of seals, I don't know whether other seals that did it, but Captain Young used to. He'd just get in it, he'd come down from his cabin, he and exec, get in the chow line, and he'd walk to the chow line, sit down at the table and eat with the guides, shoot the breeze with them. And the guys really thought a lot of him. See, they named the ship after him, a destroyer, and this ship is back at Boston. But he was a peach of a guy. Sounds like the Navy recognized how good he was, too. You bet. They really thought a lot of Captain Young. And the ship is still, still active. Well, the ship is in a museum. Oh, it is? In back in Boston. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah. that's, pretty, that's pretty nice to have yeah. them dedicated. Mm -hmm. Sure did. During your reunions, uh, ship reunions, have you ever talked to anybody that's been back to Boston to see this uh, museum? I never have, no. Which is nice to know that a, a dedicated office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, after Pearl Harbor, how long did it take to actually get the vessel repaired? It was a repair ship that had to be repaired. I got back to the ship that following Tuesday. And they were in the process right then and there of doing our own repair work because the Navy Yard uh, was concentrating on getting the combat ships back into service. But our repair parties were already uh, working on our own ship, putting a patch on the hull back aft and cleaning up uh, our own ship getting the electrical work done, getting the water back in service and everything. And it didn't take them long to get the ship back together again. It really didn't. We put our own patch back on ship, get the water pumped out, and getting the ship back afloat again. You must have worked some long, long hours. They work 24 hours a day. That's what they did. We had a wonderful, wonderful repair force aboard ship. You couldn't beat them. Good old American ingenuity. They sure did. You bet. Then you went ahead and uh, once you get the vessel repaired, then you had to begin working on other ships then? Yes. In Pearl Harbor. How long well, were you there working on other ships then in Pearl Harbor? We stayed there till August of 1942. And then we got, well, once, uh, I can't remember when we got to go into the dry dock. And they took the patch off and, you know, and we got all repaired and then we started taking ships alongside again. So you just basically get the vessel repaired enough to, to work and then had to leave it that way for about eight or nine months then. Mm -hmm. And then when we got ready to go to the South Pacific, why we went back into the Navy, into the dry dock again. And took on all supplies. We loaded the ship with uh, all new supplies. And then we took off for the South Pacific in, on the 12th of August of 1942. We went to Tonga Taboo in the South Pacific. Where was that for people that don't have any idea? 
Well, it was down in the South Pacific, uh, down around uh, uh, Samoa, down in that part of the South Pacific. And then we went from there to uh, New Caledonia. And then from New Caledonia, we went up to the New Hebrides. And we stayed there for a year. And then we went from there up to Funafuni. And then we went from there to Majuro, which is in the Marshall Islands. And that's where I left the ship in 1944. Well, we did hundreds and hundreds of repairs. So they would come back, uh, a lot of them out of combat then, and, and be ready to be worked on. Right. Yeah. How much repair could you really do? Uh, you know, did most of the ships, were you able to get them back and where they could go right back into, into the, uh, the combat? Yes. We even sent repair, repair parties on ships that uh, we were still doing repair work when the ships were in actual combat. Gosh. That had to be a lot of dedication for It us. was. It was. So while they're trying to work, all of this is happening around them. That's right. Right. I think when I went aboard in 1941, we had uh, a force of about four to 500 men. But then when the war started, why well, then we Im increased our complement to prob probably six, 650 men. And boy, they wouldn't transfer anybody of our repair parties. We, we they just wouldn't transfer them. About the only time they would transfer anybody is if they built a new repair ship back in the States, then they would repair, they would send them back to put them on a new ship because they needed their skills for to man a new ship. But boy, they wouldn't transfer them unless it was really necessary. That's right. It was. Yeah. How did you uh, get yourself resupplied? You had to have all kinds of materials when you'd go out. We would get our supply from ships coming out from the States. Was the supply line really pretty good? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. That's something that people forget, that with all of this combat going on and all of the damage, the backup system had to be good. We had a good backup system. Mm -hmm. Now that had to go into action in a hurry right after the war, even though we weren't that prepared. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Americans did a good job of getting the They did. Then. We sure did. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, <coughs> when you would, uh, when you were on the South Pacific and the ship came back from combat and needed repairs, about how long would it typically take? You know, just kind of uh, to get the repairs done and get the ship back underway. Well, see, the repair parties worked 24 hours a day. There was never any let up. We'd get a ship alongside, and they worked 24 hours a day. There was never any let up. We would either bring a ship alongside, which that's what they usually did. They'd come right alongside of our ship. And then we also had repair bar, uh, parties that went to other ships and did repair right, uh, from our ship to another ship. We had big barges that had welding machines, all generators and everything. And they would go from our ship to another ship. Did you have crews that uh, worked underwater to repair? Yes, yes. They did cutting underwater, welding underwater. They, we had divers, and they looked at, could work underwater. I bet there was a lot of that, wasn't there, with the ships coming back? Yeah. Yeah. About how many divers did you have on board at any 
given time, do you know? I have no idea. There was enough. There was, yes. Were you doing pretty much the same duties throughout the war on the vessel? I was a storekeeper aboard the vessel. I wasn't involved with the repair parties at all. I worked in the different storerooms where we had all different supplies. It sounds like you were kept busy, everybody aboard the ship was. They were, you betcha. Now some of the other ships that would go out, they'd go into combat and come back, and then they could at least kind of stand down and do some repair and relax a little. It sounds like the Vestal was just kind of at work all the time during the war. Yeah, well we weren't the only repair ship. There were other repair ships that, uh, the Medusa, the Regal, it, there were different kind of repair ships. There were others that repaired destroyers. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different tenders that repaired different types of ships. And they were all busy. Well, when you were in harbors, they had they had recreation facilities on different islands uh, where we had baseball teams and boxing and stuff like that. There was always recreation facilities that uh, you could go ashore and go swimming, play baseball, softball, basketball. They had nice repair uh, recreation facilities on these different islands. It was, it was very necessary, you bet. You say you left the ship then in 1944? Yes. Where did you I, go back then? I came back to San Diego. Cuba. We went to Australia in May of 1943. We uh, went to Sydney and went into to dry dock down there. We went down to get a radar for our ship. We never had any radar or sonar, nothing like that. And we went down to Sydney for 10 days, and that was a nice break. Everybody enjoyed it. There must have been something, no radar or sonar or anything. Yeah. Just at the mercy of, That's right. of anybody that could d defend you. But any time we went any place, we always had a destroyer escort. And of course, they had the radar and sonar capability, so, you know, it helped us. In any of the attacks, were the Japanese trying to find the repair ships? Was that something that they targeted, or was it struck with the, the cruisers, battleships? Oh, I imagine they would. They would. But we were, we were fortunate. Well, repair ships were kind of the lifeline for the whole fleet. Yes, they were very important. Yeah, they were very important. Are there any experiences or things that you just kind of remember that uh, are kind of interesting to, to look back on? Or did you have any specific, you know, just fun things or uh, something that uh, that you remember? Oh, I think the most important thing I remember is when we got to go to Australia. It was a big break for the crew to go ashore down there, and we had a good time down there. We enjoyed ourselves. How are the Australian people? They were wonderful people. They really treated us nice. We enjoyed the gals. They had nice women down there. There was a lot of things to do, a lot of nice restaurants, nice theaters, nice beaches to go swimming on, nice dance halls. We really enjoyed ourselves. They had to appreciate the American forces because they were so close to what was happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have more questions here. Yeah, I've got a couple more. Uh, uh, when you went back to San Diego, why did you go back to San Diego, and uh, what did you do after you, you got back off the vessel? Well, when I went to San Diego, I, uh, I got, I was on my way back to Asbury Park, New Jersey, to midshipman school, and I got a chance to come back and see my folks at Frederick. I only had a couple of days leave, and then I caught the city of Denver to Chicago, and then right on back to 
Asbury Park, New Jersey. So I had a couple of days leave with my folks in, in Frederick. And then when I went back to Asbury Park, New Jersey, I was there for a month at a pre-midshipment school. And then I got assigned to Colorado College in Colorado Springs for six months. And then I didn't make it in Colorado College, so I got transferred to uh, uh, San Francisco. And I was there for a couple of months, and then I went from there to the Philippines, to Naval Ammunition Depot. Yeah. Yeah, I went to uh, the Philippines. I left uh, right when President Roosevelt died. And I was out there for 19 months. Was that all ashore? In yeah. Naval Ammunition Depot in Samar. Was the fighting pretty much done there at that point? Yeah, because right after we got there, we got there in May. And then the Japanese, what they gave up when in August, August 45. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, uh, stockpiling ammunition and supplies for? Yeah, we had a big ammunition depot there at Samar. And that would have eventually been transferred up to Japan. And thank goodness it never happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you aware of exactly what all that was for when you were there in the Philippines at Samar? Yeah. Because a lot of our ammunition were on barges, floating barges. And that would eventually ended up for an invasion of Japan. But of course, it never happened. Thank goodness. Yeah. How did you get picked for uh, midshipman school, and uh, uh, was there a big program at Colorado College when you were Yeah, they had these, v, these V-12 programs all over the United States. And when I was aboard ship, why, they uh, announced this program, and I had to take a whole bunch of tests aboard ship. And luckily, I passed them and got accepted and was transferred to the midshipman school at Asbury Park, New Jersey. What kind of training was that? Just, uh... It was a college course down at Colorado College. They tried to get you as close to home as they could. They had a program over Colorado University in, Colorado, in Boulder, and they had a program down at Colorado College, and they put me down at Colorado College. And I was there from June until December of 1945. That's mm -hmm. kind of nice because at least you could visit family. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I really did. You kind of earned it by that time. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if you'd gone through the training and uh, they sent you eventually back over to the Philippines, were you... Had you been promoted and had higher rank and responsibilities? Yeah, well, I probably would have never gotten commission because the war ended. So when uh, the war was over then, you were in the Philippines. How quickly did you get back stateside? I never got back to the States until uh, till 19, December 1946. You see, I was regular Navy, and I enlisted for six years. And see, when the war ended in in 1945, I still had, or ni yeah, 45, I still had a year to go. How many of the guys really were regular Navy that you were around? Most all of them were reserves. So I had 
No, I had to go to 1947 to get out. Did you get out then? Yeah. Yeah. You've talked about a career in the Navy at, at one point. If you just changed your mind. Yeah. Point. Yeah. You had 20 years already in, didn't you? In just about five or six years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did you do when you came back then? Well, after I came back to the States, I got a 60-day leave. And then when I went back to San Diego, I was stationed at North Island Naval Air Station. I stayed there, and then I got out in July 1947 and came back home and went to work for the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Stayed there 32 years. Gosh, what did you do at the Arsenal? Oh, I worked out in a toxic yard, warehouse. I had quite a few different jobs at the arsenal. How was it working out there? You know, there was a, that had to be you know, pretty active right after the war, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. No, I enjoyed working out at the arsenal. I really did. I'm just trying to think here that uh, you spent all that time overseas and uh, you must have how many years did you have overseas aboard ship or in the Philippines I had uh, 51 months overseas 32 months aboard ship and then 19 months in the Philippines did I enjoyed it I had a lot of nice friends made a lot of nice friends a lot of nice people in the Philippines the Philippines were a lot of nice people there. They really were. Good workers, good people. They had to be pretty grateful that uh, the Americans had come back at that point. Yeah. And they were darn good workers. That's good. That's, that's amazing. How You got there right after the uh, Philippines had been uh, retaken? Yes. We had a lot of good workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of destruction in the Philippines when you got there? Not where we were. Not where we were. See, Samar was clear in the southern part of the Philippines. And we were away, we were away out in the jungle, being an ammunition depot. I guess logic says that's, that's yeah. a good idea. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of floating barges that the ammunition was on. Oh, let's see. They were about 100 feet long and probably 30 feet wide. How would those have been transported if we had gone into Japan? Uh, like these barges that you see on the Mississippi River by, by tugboat. So they were fully seaworthy then? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Big barges. Mm -hmm. They were all covered. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, the American forces were really ready to go into Japan if they had to, that everything was in place? I really don't know what our forces, because a lot of our forces would have con come from Europe, because I had friends that were stationed in Europe that were ready to go to Japan. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. As we understand from people we've talked to, the fighting conditions were just totally, they were just totally different from the Pacific to the yes. European field. Yeah, I had a good friend from Frederick that was in the Rainbow Division in Europe that said they were to go to the Pacific, specifically to go to Japan. And thank goodness it didn't happen. Uh, he didn't. He didn't really say, but he said they were supposed to have gone to the Pacific to go to Japan. 
Yeah. The atomic bomb really did save a lot of lives. Though. I think so. I think they made the right decision. It would have been, I know it was terrible to drop it, but I think it saved a lot of American lives in the long run. Well, getting back to uh, when you came back, you went to Rocky Flats, so you just kind of went back to work, and where did you settle? Right? I went to Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. We live so close that we're... <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. But uh, when did you marry, and uh, when did you uh, start a family? I started Rocky Mountain Arsenal on the 15th of September in 1948, and I got married the 15th of October of 1948, a month later. Where'd you meet your wife? I met my wife through our church in Frederick. We went to the same little church in Frederick, and we lived in Dakota for, from 1948 until 1968, 65. And that's when we moved here to Brighton. We lived here ever since. So Colorado is, and uh, this part of uh, the area is really your home. Also. Yeah, we lived just 15 miles from where both of us were born and raised. Yeah. Have you been uh, active around uh, Brighton, any kind of uh, activities here at all, or led Dakota to, and uh, Frederick? Well, we've always been active in our church in, in both towns. Yeah. What about children? Well, we have four children. We have two sons. One son's in San Pedro. One daughter's in Canada. One daughter is in Los Angeles. And our other son is up in Evans, Colorado. Give us just a little rundown on each one. Give us their names. And one in San Pedro, what's he doing there? Well, Harry worked in the shipyards out in San Pedro. Our one daughter lives up in Squamish, British Columbia. What's her name? Edie Hall. She has two daughters. One daughter, Amy Upke. She and her husband live in Los Angeles. Our other son, David Noop, is in Evans, Colorado. Do they all go to school through high school in this area? Uh, all four of our kids went here to school in Brighton, graduated from Brighton. Then what, what kind of school did they have after that? Our one daughter graduated from CSU, and none of the other children went to college. They all graduated from Brighton High School. Well, the GI Bill was available. Did you ever think about taking that? I went to one year of DU after I got out of the Navy. And then I got married, and that's as far as I went college-wise. Were you able to take advantage of the GI Bill for, for housing? For what? Any housing? No. No. Never did. Oh, one thing we didn't get. Let's get your wife's name. Let's, what's your wife's name? My wife, wife's name is Joyce. And what was her maiden name? Warmberg. She and her dad and my dad worked in the coal mines for 40-some years together over over to Kona. They were both coal miners for years and years and years. Did you know her before you went off to work? No. I knew her. I went to school with her sister. But we've known each other for years and years and years. We've been married 53 years. We had a wonderful married life. I hope it continues for many years to come. That's another thing about World War II veterans. Uh, marriage was marriage, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Do you think there's a, a special kind of set of values that uh, your generation has that uh, was really good for the country? Well, I think our values are different from what they are today. I just wish our young people that are married today had our values. I wish they would marry and stay together instead of breaking up, breaking up their families. I think kids today don't take 
they take Mary altogether different than what we do with our marriages. I wish they would try to stick together instead of breaking up families. We have a daughter that's going through a divorce. It's tough, tough on kids. They don't realize what it's doing to kids. It's kind of a case, uh, there was so much dedication from your generation and you knew that she had to work hard for everything. That's right. And uh, you didn't give up on things. No, we didn't. And I hate to see kids give up too easily. I wish they would try to really stay together and not demand so much so soon. Make a go of marriage. That, you know. Well, you think about what's happening to Colorado in the last few years. You've seen an awful lot of change in your time. Well, I guess so. I wish it would slow down, but it's not going to happen, I don't think. Did it surprise you that everybody started to move here the way they did? It sure has. I think we're going way, way too fast, but I guess maybe that's progress. Too many people have found out about what we think of color. Yeah, we, that's for sure. What do you think about, uh, oh, say, the young people now? Do they really understand what you guys went through in World War II? Say the young uh, school children, all, you know, from elementary all the way through high school. I hope they do. I really, I really hope that they realize what World War II was all about. And I'm glad my sons never had to participate in Vietnam or Korea. And I hope my grandkids never have to participate in a, in a war. Do you think your own children know about what you did and appreciate what you did? I think they do. They, they've talked about it with me, and I think they appreciate what uh, not only I, but what other thousands and thousands went through during World War II, Vietnam, and Korea. I think they do. I hope they do. Has it been kind of good to see things like Tom Brokaw and uh, what he really started the interest in? Yes. In veterans. Uh, do you think that's been good for for, the, for your generation? I think it has. Yeah. I think we've done very well here. I think so, too. Well, yeah. you, you are a wealth of information. Well, I hope so. Oh, yes. But I think you'll enjoy talking to some other Pearl survivors that will have a wealth of Im information. We will we'll enjoy all of them just like you. This has been good. Well, I hope so. Well, I hope so. We find, and, uh, I've tried to be truthful with you. I haven't tried to embellish anything. That we know. I hope so. <laughs> we yeah. understand that totally. And that's, oh, this has been great. I hope so. I'm sure glad you stuck to your guns and got back to your questions. Okay. And did this. Yeah.